It would have been difficult, perhaps, to find in the whole of America a more ordinary man than Mr. Thornton Busk. He came to Hollywood from New York because he thought he might do a little writing for the films. He had been in Hollywood five years, and during that time he was happy rather than successful. He was good-looking in a quite ordinary way, dark and slim and always correctly dressed, and he was useful to women who did not know what to do at that time. He discovered to his mild surprise that he was not needed by anybody to write for films, yet he didn't really feel himself ill-used. There are so many parties in Hollywood that you can go out somewhere all the time, wherever you are. But at the end of five years, Mr. Busk discovered with a shock that his capital was almost gone. It was then that he began to think seriously of a charming English lady, Mrs. Grace Ferguson. Mrs. Ferguson was a rich widow who had a pretty house and entertained a great deal in a quiet fashion. She was one of the English who, coming to California on a short visit, are entrapped by the sun and never again escape. Her husband had been dead some ten years. She was quite alone in the world. Except for her large white cat, Penelope, she had apparently no near friends. Of course, there were horrible times when Mrs. Ferguson felt lonely and wondered if she really had any friends. At such horrible moments, she would feel a great wave of homesickness for her native England. Then, quickly again, would come the delightful excitements of her social world. A concert in the Hollywood Bowl, or a most interesting lecture given by a yogi from India. And Thornton Busk was part of this world. A charming man, always smiling, always at your service. A little flirtatious, but not to any dangerous extent. Good-hearted and unselfish. She liked him very much indeed. And for Thornton Busk, she was a splendid way out of all his troubles. He began to pay her court. Grace Ferguson's house was in the English style. Her drawing room and dining room were in white. Everything was in admirable taste, but a little like herself, quietly aesthetic, rather without personality, gently hospitable. On a certain afternoon, Mr. Busk found himself sitting at the end of the sofa, very close to her. It was all very restful, very friendly, almost intimate. And he leaned over the end of the sofa and with one hand touched her arm. She glanced up at him as though she would say, Aren't you a little different today? What's happened? And he felt different. He thought, for the first time since he had known her, that he would like to take her in his arms and kiss her. And then he noticed the cat. She was called Penelope, and she was a large and pure white Persian. Penelope seemed really to be devoted to Grace. When Grace left the room, the cat sank into a sort of cold neutrality. Mr. Busk had sometimes attempted to win it over, but Penelope would never have anything to do with him. It wasn't that she disliked him. It was rather that he did not seem to exist. This afternoon was the first time he was aware that the cat quite definitely regarded him. As he touched Grace's hand for that brief instant, the cat, that had been lying in a great white mass near the window, raised itself ever so slightly. The big, handsome head turned in his direction. You know, Mr. Rusk said, I don't think that cat likes me. Perhaps it doesn't, she replied. Penelope can be jealous. Penelope isn't an ordinary cat. It was after this little conversation that Thornton began to be involved in strange personal experiences. In the first place, he had a strange sense of urgency, as though someone whispered to him, Lose no time over this, or it will be too late. He developed a kind of obsession for Grace Ferguson, though not so much for herself as for her possessions. So the afternoon came when he decided to propose marriage. It was a foggy, cold afternoon with a mist that seemed gloomily alive. Her drawing room was cheerful, a log fire was burning, and he noticed again how brilliant and fresh her pictures and curtains and furniture were. When he entered the room, 
The white cat was asleep in front of the fire. The Chinese manservant said that his mistress would be down in a few minutes. He was alone with Penelope. It was then that he realised fully that he hated to be alone with the cat. The animal had not moved, and then, quite suddenly, it stretched out a lazy paw and scratched the carpet. The sound made him shiver. Don't do that, he said aloud. The cat turned its head. Nothing in the room moved, and yet it seemed to him that the cat had come closer and grown larger. The whole room was filled with a sort of warm, furry odour, almost as though he would soon be stifled with it. Grace came in, and he gave a little sigh of relief. He had his highball, and she had her tea. And then he said, his voice shaking a little, um, Grace, I want to tell you, uh, I have been wanting to for weeks. I'm in love with you. At the same time, he put out his hand and caught hers. She said nothing, and he began to be uneasy. We are uh, neither of us children, he said. I'm not much. I haven't anything to offer except devotion and loyalty, but I'll be as good to you as I know how. He had a ridiculous notion that he was quoting something from a story in a magazine. She did not take her hand away. She even pressed his a little. I've been married once, you know, she said, but I like you very much, Thornton. Uh, but I've got accustomed to my life as it is. It isn't perfect, nobody's life is. But on the whole, it's safe. And I'm not quite alone. Uh, there's Penelope. Penelope, he said mockingly. Oh, you don't know. You'd be surprised if you did. Uh, uh, let me think it over, Thornton. Leave me to myself for a day or two. It was then that Thornton saw the cat rise very slowly from its place in front of the fire and walk across the room. It was a strange thing, but both of them turned and stared at it. It walked as though it saw neither of them. And yet Thornton felt that it enclosed him, tightened the air about his nose and throat and mouth. Three days later, she said that she would marry him. After all, she admitted, her cheek pressed against his, it's only Penelope who'll object. That damn cat he said, drawing away from her. I wouldn't mind having it chloroformed. I don't think you could, she said. If she didn't want to be chloroformed, she wouldn't be, whatever you might do. Thornton Busk went away from the house that evening, less happy than he should be. He did not know what was the matter with him. He ought to be radiant. He was not in love with Grace, but he was very fond of her. Financially, he was safe for life. Mr. Busk went home. He opened his door, entered his sitting room. There, staring at him, was the white cat. He looked again. It was not there. Now, this is absurd, he told himself. That cat is beginning to get on my nerves. But he still felt in his nostrils a warm, furry, stifling sensation. He went and had a shower and changed his clothes. He telephoned Grace. Just to know whether you're happy, darling? Of course I'm happy. Yes, of course. Is uh, Penelope sitting there in front of the fire? Yes, as a matter of fact, she's on my lap. Why? I'm always seeing your cat. At least I... I don't know whether I see it or don't. Oh, Penelope has been rather strange the last few days, she said. I felt a little frightened of her myself, as though I were doing something wrong. You do love me, Thornton, don't you? Because if you didn't, if you were marrying me for some other reason, I can imagine Penelope doing something terrible. Two nights later, Mr. Busk awoke suddenly and thought that he was choking to death. He sat up, gasping beating the air with his hands. As he sat there, his heart hammering, his whole body trembling, staring into the darkness, something again whispered to him. Give this marriage up. You're in danger. 
Next day, he felt so unwell that he consulted a doctor. There was, it seemed, nothing actually the matter with him, but his friends all noticed the change. He was pale, and he looked as though he hadn't slept. For three days, he did not see Grace, and even considered going away. Something was driving him. He would borrow money from someone there and go to Europe. He would fly to New York. He nearly did, but instead, he stayed. On the third evening, he went to bed early. He had no appetite. His whole body was weary. Was it influenza? He took several aspirins and a strong highball. He awoke quite suddenly with a start of apprehension. He switched on the light and saw that it was a quarter to three in the morning. Then he looked around the room and saw the white cat lying up against the wall opposite the bed. He tried to move, but felt that he was caught by the bedclothes. He pushed against them and got one bare foot to the floor. At the same moment, the cat moved, stretched first one leg, then the other, then very softly came towards him. When it was halfway across the floor, it crouched as though it might spring with a tiger's action. He screamed, Get out! Get out! And then, drawing himself back into bed again, moved to the other side, away from the door. The cat moved towards the bed, and now it was so close to him that he could feel the hot jungle air of its breath, and in its deep grey eyes he saw an intensity of malevolence. He made a movement, and the cat, drawing itself on its belly, came to the very edge of the bed. He looked up. His mouth opened for a scream of terror, but no sound came. The cat leapt. He felt its claws on his cheek. He was stifled with a press of warm fur. When next morning Grace Ferguson read that Mr Thornton Busk was found in his apartment dead, she burst into tears. It seemed that he had died of heart failure. On each cheek, there was a tiny scratch for which there was no accounting. She cried her heart out. She'd been so very fond of Thornton. Poor Thornton. The Chinese boy brought in the saucer of milk for Penelope. Grace Ferguson blew her nose, dried her eyes, and with her voice a little broken with crying, said, Come, Penelope, here's your milk, darling. And the cat got up, walked across to the saucer, and began happily to lap.